The Lives of the Saints by the Reverend Alban Butler, taken from the fourth edition published in 1954. January 15th, St. Paul the First Hermit. Elias and St. John the Baptist sanctified the deserts, and Jesus Christ himself was a model of the eremitical state during his 40 days fast in the wilderness. Neither is it to be questioned, but the Holy Ghost conducted the saint of this day, though young, into the desert, and was to him an instructor there. But it is not less certain that an entire solitude and total sequestration of oneself from human society is one of those extraordinary ways by which God leads souls to himself, and is more worthy of our admiration than calculated for imitation and practice. It is a state which ought only to be embraced by such as are already well experienced in the practices of virtue and contemplation, and who can resist sloth and other temptations, lest, instead of being a help, it prove a snare and stumbling block in their way to heaven. This saint was a native of the lower Thebais in Egypt, and had lost both his parents when he was but fifteen years of age. Nevertheless, he was a great proficient in the Greek and Egyptian learning, was mild and modest, and feared God from his earliest youth. The bloody persecution of Decius disturbed the peace of the church in 250. And what was most dreadful, Satan by his ministers sought not so much to kill the bodies as by subtle artifices and tedious tortures to destroy the souls of men. During these times of danger, Paul kept himself concealed in the house of another. But finding that a brother-in-law was inclined to betray him, that he might enjoy his estate, he fled into the deserts. There he found many spacious caverns in a rock, which were said to have been the retreat of money coiners in the days of Cleopatra, queen of Egypt. He chose for his dwelling a cave in this place, near which were a palm tree and a clear spring. The former by its leaves furnished him with raiment and by its fruit with food and the latter supplied him with water for his drink. Paul was 22 years old when he entered the desert. His first intention was to enjoy the liberty of serving God till the persecution should cease. But relishing the sweets of heavenly contemplation and penance and learning the spiritual advantages of holy solitude, he resolved to return no more among men or concerned himself in the least with human affairs and what passed in the world. It was enough for him to know that there was a world and to pray that it might be improved in goodness. The saint lived on the fruit of his tree till he was 43 years of age, and from that time till his death, like Elias, he was miraculously fed with bread brought him every day by a raven. His method of life and what he did in this place during 90 years is unknown to us, but God was pleased to make his servant known a little before his death. The great Saint Anthony, who was then ninety years of age, was tempted to vanity, as if no one had served God so long in the wilderness as he had done, imagining himself also to be the first example of a life so recluse from human conversation. But the contrary was discovered to him in a dream the night following, and the saint was at the same time commanded by Almighty God to set out forthwith in quest of a perfect servant of his, concealed in the more remote parts of those deserts. The holy old man set out the next morning in search of the unknown hermit. St. Jerome relates from his authors that he met a centaur, or creature, not with the nature and properties, but with something of the mixed shape of man and horse. And that this monster or phantom of the devil, St. Jerome pretends not to determine which it was, upon his making the sign of the cross fled away, after having pointed out the way to the saint. Our author adds that St. Anthony soon after met a satyr, who gave him to understand that he was an inhabitant of those deserts, and one of that sort whom the deluded Gentiles adored for gods. St. Anthony, after two days and a night spent in the search, discovered the saint's abode by a light that was in it, which he made up to. Having long begged admittance at the door of his cell, St. Paul at last opened it with a smile. They embraced, called each other by their names, which they knew by divine revelation. St. Paul then inquired whether idolatry still reigned in the world. 
While they were discoursing together, a raven flew towards them and dropped a loaf of bread before them, upon which St. Paul said, Our good God has sent us a dinner. In this manner have I received half a loaf every day these sixty years past. Now you are come to see me. Christ has doubled his provision for his servants. Having given thanks to God, they both sat down by the fountain, but a little contest arose between them who should break the bread. St. Anthony alleged St. Paul's greater age, and St. Paul pleaded that St. Anthony was the stranger. Both agreed at last to take up their parts together. Having refreshed themselves at the spring, they spent the night in prayer. The next morning St. Paul told his guest that the time of his death approached and that he was sent to bury him, adding, Go and fetch the cloak given you by St. Athanasius, Bishop of Alexandria, in which I desire you to wrap my body. This he might say with the intent of being left alone in prayer whilst he expected to be called out of this world as also that he might testify his veneration for St. Athanasius and his high regard for the faith and communion of the Catholic Church, on account of which that holy bishop was then a great sufferer. St. Anthony was surprised to hear him mention the cloak, which he could not have known but by divine revelation. Whatever was his motive for desiring to be buried in it, St. Anthony acquiesced to what was asked of him. So after mutual embraces, he hastened to his monastery to comply with St. Paul's request. He told his monks that he, a sinner, falsely bore the name of a servant of God, but that he had seen Elias and John the Baptist in the wilderness, even Paul in paradise. Having taken the cloak, he returned with it in all haste, fearing lest the holy hermit might be dead as it happened. Whilst on his road he saw his happy soul carried up to heaven, attended by choirs of angels, prophets and apostles. St. Anthony, though he rejoiced on St. Paul's account, could not help lamenting on his own for having lost the treasure so lately discovered. As soon as his sorrow would permit, he arose, pursued his journey and came to the cave. Going in, he found the body kneeling and the hands stretched out. Full of joy and supposing him yet alive, he knelt down to pray with him, but by his silence soon perceived he was dead. Having paid his last respects to the holy corpse, he carried it out of the cave. Whilst he stood perplexed how to dig a grave, two lions came up quietly, and as it were mourning, and tearing up the ground, made a hole large enough for the reception of a human body. St. Anthony then buried the corpse, singing hymns and psalms according to what was usual and appointed by the church on that occasion. After this he returned home praising God and related to his monks what he had seen and done. He always kept as a great treasure and wore himself on great festivals the garment of St. Paul of palm tree leaves patched together. St. Paul died in the year of our Lord 342, the 113th year of his age and the 90th of his solitude and is usually called the first hermit, to distinguish him from others of that name. St. Paul the Hermit is commemorated in several ancient Western mythologies on the 10th of January, but in the Roman on the 15th, on which he is honored in the Anthologium of the Greeks. An eminent contemplative draws the following portraiture of his great model of an eremitical life. St. Paul the Hermit not being called by God to the external duties of an active life, remained alone, conversing only with God in a vast wilderness for the space of near a hundred years, ignorant of all that passed in the world, both of progress of sciences, the establishment of religion, and the revolutions of states and empires, indifferent even as to those things without which he could not live, as the air which he breathed, the water he drank, and the miraculous bread with which he supported life. What did he do, said the inhabitants of this busy world, who think they could not live without being in a perpetual hurry of restless projects? What was his employment all this while? Alas, ought we not rather to put this question to them? What are you doing whilst you are not taken up in doing the will of God? which occupies the heavens and the earth and all their motions. Do you call that doing nothing 
which is the great end God proposed to himself in giving us as a being, that is, to be employed in contemplating, adoring and praising him. To be employed in anything else, how great or noble, soever it may appear in the eyes of men, unless it be referred to God and be the accomplishment of his holy will, who in all our action demands our heart more than our hand. What is it but to turn ourselves away from our end, to lose our time, and voluntarily to return again to that state of nothing out of which we were formed, or rather into a far worse state.